Thank you, Seth. And before I read, I need to take care of some family business. Rachel, your daughter is on the third row. She's back there in the back, frantically looking, and uh, she's right there. You never know. They can get away from you. And, you know. Well, we are finishing our studies in the book of Ephesians this morning, and I've taken a rather long section, but it's all pretty much one section, at least verses 10 through 20, the spiritual warfare, and then some concluding remarks that Paul makes to end this great study in the book of Ephesians. But we're going to begin with verse 10 of Ephesians 6 and read through verse 24. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that you also may know about my circumstances, how I am doing Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you with, for this very purpose, so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless, bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. John Le Carre was an agent in British intelligence, a spy before becoming a writer of spy novels. He described espionage as the secret theater of our society. It's unsettling to think enemy agents are moving among us unseen and wanting to do us harm, but there's something more unseen and nefarious than that, not flesh and blood, spiritual forces. Paul calls them rulers, powers, forces of this darkness and wickedness in heavenly places. Martin Luther included them in his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed His truth to triumph through us. That's a nice summary of Paul's instruction in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, where he moves from the subject of 
marriage and the Christian home to the subject of the spiritual conflict. He begins it in verses 10 and 11 with a call to arms. Be strong, he wrote. Stand firm against the schemes of the devil. That's a real challenge. John Calvin saw that. He recognized the difficulty of it. He wrote, our difficulties are far greater than if we had to fight against men. That's true. We're fighting an invisible war. So Paul tells us how to do that. It's not be strong or strengthen yourselves, but be strong in the Lord. And to do that, he added, in the strength of His might. We're no match for the evil one. He could sift any one of us like wheat just as He did Peter. But we're not alone. We're not in this by ourselves. We are in the Lord and having His strength and His might, which is almighty. So, we're fit for conflict, but we're also equipped for conflict. And in verse 11, Paul tells us to use our weapons. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The Lord has not put us on the battlefield weak and unarmed. He has called us to fight, and He has made generous provision for that. So we're to take up those weapons, and we're to stand firm, and we are to fight the devil. Specifically, he wrote, we are to stand against the schemes of the devil. His schemes are temptations. They are lies. The Lord called him a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies. He is the master of the lie. He is the great counterfeiter. Luther called him God's ape. He imitates the Lord. He disguises himself as an angel of light, Paul told the Corinthians. It's a mistake to think of the devil as some ghoulish figure with horns, a tail, and cloven hooves. Just the opposite. He enlists in his service the the winsome, people who are clever and attractive, and he inspires them. He does it from the beginning. We see that from the very outset, from Genesis chapter 3. He used the serpent, who is described as more crafty than any beast of the field. And through it, he posed as Eve's friend to gain her confidence, and then cast doubt on God's Word. Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Is he that uncaring and that stingy that he would do that? Well, no, he didn't say that. He said, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely, except one tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so the devil The serpent continued denying that truth, casting doubt on the Lord's Word, and then denying the penalty. You surely will not die, he says. And you can see in all of this, what he's really saying is, God wants to rob you of of the best. He wants to rob you of enlightenment and fulfillment and deny you an authentic life. Trust me. I want your best. Eat. Eat. Go ahead, Eve, eat. And ever since, he's been tempting people to taste forbidden fruit, temptations of pleasure that result in moral ruin and enslavement. Isaiah said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. That's satanic. Isaiah also said, Woe to those who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. It's it's the allure of of various things, of intellectualism for some, the temptation to professionalism for others, the temptation of ambition. Nothing wrong with being eager to succeed in whatever field you're in 
and desiring to do the best, that's good. But ambition for selfish reasons, that's the allure that Satan brings into the lives of individuals. It's, it's just a variation on his original scheme in Genesis chapter 3. Distorting God's Word, casting doubt on it, and, and giving an attractive alternative that pleases self and puts self first. He has lots of schemes, but basically his design is to deceive and destroy. He is, is clever and evil, and the, the only answer to the counterfeit is the authentic. The only answer to the lie is the truth. It's the Word of God. We must know it. And what we learn from the outset, the beginning of the Bible is, He is. The devil is real. He exists. That's important because one of the cleverest schemes he's ever devised is to convince people that he doesn't exist. In, in C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters, which is, I, I commend it to your reading, it's an excellent, insightful description of the very thing we're studying here, the, the spiritual battle. But in it, Screw Tape, who's the master demon, explains to his nephew demon, who's just learning the practice, the policy that had, as he put it, come down from high command, that for the moment we are to conceal ourselves. Of course, he states, this has always been, this has not always been so. We uh, are really faced with a cruel dilemma. When the humans disbelieve in our existence, we lose the pleasure, the pleasing results of direct terrorism and we make no magicians. On the other hand, when they believe in us, we cannot make them materialists and skeptics. And Satan has certainly succeeded in, in achieving that, making skeptics and materialists. People aren't aware of his existence, and they, as a result, can't fight against him, and as a result, he can take them captive. That's that, that can even affect Christians in, in this whole uh, world in which we live, this, this life in which we live, very much so. Bunyan saw that in Pilgrim's Progress. It's another book I can recommend if you want to know the spiritual battle. Bunyan had such insight on the various things that the believer faces. And so early on, in Christian's pilgrimage and his journey to the heavenly city. He's traveling through the valley of the shadow of death and he was confused. Bunyan said he didn't know his own voice. And that's when, as Bunyan puts it, one of the wicked ones got up behind him and stepped up softly to him and, worse, and whisperingly suggested many blasphemies to him which he thought were coming from his own mind. Now well, that brought him to a very low state, but Bunyan said he had not the discretion either to stop his ears or to know from whence those blasphemies came. And so he struggled. That's a scheme of the devil. He's able to place doubts in people's minds. They, they wonder, where is this coming from? What kind of a person am I? And it's... Uh, very discouraging in the Christian life. Well, Paul wants us to understand clearly the devil's schemes. So he won't snare us in his traps. He has help, wicked ones, as, as Bunyan called them. Paul describes them as an invisible army. Verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is a well-organized force that fills the air. Demons are like those that, that, that uh, Jesus dealt with throughout His ministry. Those that Jesus cast out of Legion and then out of Mary Magdalene and out of numerous people. Evil angels in a uh, hostile spiritual army. 
but also a defeated army. Christ crushed Satan under his feet on the cross and he captured the demonic forces, disarming them and displaying them in his triumph. That's how Paul describes his triumph in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Nevertheless, though Satan's doom is sure, he's still in the air with a, a hostile host of devils, which, as Luther said, threatened to undo us. They can still do harm. So we must be ready and we must be active. That's Paul's instruction in verse 13. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, to stand firm. It's the armor of God. Not our armor, the armor of God. It is His power and His enablement. But it requires our response, our cooperation with Him. We, we are responsible to act and take up the armor. And the reason is, the evil day is coming. Well, what is the evil day? It doesn't define it for us, but it seems to su suggest a specific day of, of special pressure, of intense testing. Not, not every day is like that. Well, it may be, but we don't sense it. Most, most days in the Christian life are often routine and, and maybe peaceful, hopefully peaceful. And then suddenly, unexpectedly, things change. Trials occur that, that can't be anticipated and that shake us to the core. We can't predict it. So we must always be prepared for it. Always standing in full armor, ready for the battle, ready for the evil day. William Gurnall was a, a Puritan who wrote a large book on this passage, almost 1,500 pages uh, on 11 verses. I have it in my library. It sits up there on my shelf. I've had it for 30 years or 40 years, and I say, someday I'm going to read that book. <laughs> Well, I've, I've read some of it, and it's, uh, it's a classic, but um, he stated, In heaven we will wear robes of glory, but now we must wear armor at all times. We must be ready at all times, he said. The saint's sleeping time is Satan's tempting time. And that's true. Look at Peter and James and John in the Garden of Gethsemane when the Lord said, guard and watch for me while I pray. And they fell asleep and they weren't ready for the army that came. Well, Paul describes the, the armor in the next verse that we're to be wearing at all times, as Grinnell said. He lists six pieces in verses 14 through 17. Then in verses 18 and 19, he added prayer. Prayer is not listed as one of the weapons, one of the tools, but it certainly is part of this whole this necessary uh, uh, arsenal that we have. It's the, the seventh weapon, I would say. All of these are, are what enable us to stand. The first piece of armor listed is the belt of truth. Put it on. Gird yourself with it. Put it around your waist. This was the essential piece of equipment for a Roman soldier. The belt was leather and it, it kept the armor in place. The breastplate and sword were attached to it. And so first of all, the belt must be on so that the armor is in place. And the significance of that should be very clear. This is the belt of truth. Truth comes first. Not, not truth generally, not the truth of mathematics or biology or any list of uh, those kinds of subjects, but this is the truth of the gospel specifically. The doctrines of the Word of God, they, they hold everything in place. Before we can ever act or think correctly, understand the situation and the, the perspective of the problems, we must have the truth buckled on. 
So we begin with faith in God. We begin with faith in His revelation. We believe, begin understanding and knowing the doctrines of the faith. We cannot measure error unless we have the measuring stick, which is the truth of God. That's essential. That's the reason Satan's first scheme was to attack God's Word. Indeed, has God said? Has He really put this onus burden on you of not eating any fruit? How unfair. He's always doing that. If He can't get us to doubt its truth, if He can't get us to doubt the goodness of God's Word, the goodness of God and His revelation, He tries to keep us out of His revelation. He tries to keep us too busy to read our Bibles and meditate on it. And we are busy. I know that. I, I'm not busy like you are. I have, my days are to be dedicated to reading and studying this book. And you don't have that opportunity like I do. I'm aware of that. But nevertheless, it is essential that you study the Word of God and He will feel He's been triumphant over you if He keeps you out of Scripture. We need it. We need to meditate on it daily. A few years earlier, before writing this letter from Rome, Paul met with the Ephesian elders for the last time at Miletus, which is just south of Ephesus. It's recorded in Acts chapter 20. He reminded them that when he was with them ministering in Ephesus for two and a half to three years from roughly A.D. 53 to 57, he, he did not shrink, he said, from declaring to them the whole counsel of God. I think that word shrink is significant because what he's saying is there, there are doctrines that preachers and teachers would like to uh, maybe not speak about too much. We shrink away from it. No, it's going to be offensive. People aren't going to like it. People are going to challenge him on that. And this is, I didn't shrink away from any of it. I gave you the whole counsel of God in that two and a half, three year period. And then he warned them that savage wolves would come in among them, men who introduce error and undermine the gospel. That's Satan's way. Only truth, only pure doctrine will answer that. And when we come to the end, as we all must do, on our deathbed and the devil steps up softly behind us and whispers terrors in our ear, nothing will calm and give hope like the truth of God and the promises of God. So Paul begins here with the thing of first importance. Stand firm, having girded your loins with truth, having buckled the belt of truth around your waist. That will keep everything in place. Second piece of armor is the breastplate. On a Roman soldier, this was a, a metal piece that covered the, the front of his body and protected the, the vital organs from a thrust of a sword or spear. So for the uh, Christian soldier, the spiritual warrior, it is righteousness. Now that could mean righteous behavior, righteous obedience, uh, conduct that's righteous. That, that is the view of some. Paul used the word in that way in chapter 4, verse 24, and chapter 5, verse 9. So that would be solid reason for taking it that way. But generally, Paul used this word righteousness of imputed righteousness. The imputed righteousness of Christ a believer receives at the moment of faith. Justification. And that makes good sense here. Paul was telling the Ephesians and, and us to remember that they were justified. Remember that they were for, forgiven fully, that they possessed the righteousness of Christ, that they were accounted by God to be right with Him and reckon it to be true. 
That is essential to understand. That is essential for our practical behavior, for our life. God the Father accepts us as righteous. He accepts us as perfect. Not because of anything that we have done or will do, but what Christ did, what His Son did as our substitute in death. At the cross, all of our sins were laid on Him. He suffered the complete penalty for them, paid up our debts in full. That payment and that punishment is ours the moment we join ourselves to Him in faith. The moment you put your faith in Christ, you are considered righteous by Him and forever. There's nothing more for us to do. The work of salvation is finished. We are fully and forever received by God into His family as His son or daughter. That's the basis for Christian assurance, and, the, and Christian assurance is essential for a healthy, active Christian life. It's the basis of Christian behavior. Since we are children of God forever, we don't need to strive to gain God's acceptance. Instead, we reckon ourselves to be children of God and we behave like it. So I say it's the basis for proper behavior. Proper behavior is essential in the Christian life. Those who are born again, who have a new nature, a new heart, are going to live that way. And the thing that should stimulate that kind of life is an understanding of what Christ has done for us. The love of Christ compels me. Controls me, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.14. As he understood God's love for him and Christ's love for him, the, the love of the triune God for him, it moved him to serve and sacrifice and live a, a pure and godly life. So, we're to reckon ourselves dead to sin. We're to reckon ourselves righteous with God and behave like it. Satan tries to draw us away from our assurance. He doesn't want us to, to have that healthy understanding of who we are and what God's done for us and, and, and how we're to live. And so he seeks to frustrate us in that way and, and uh, leaves us in this, leave us in this kind of confused condition and not understanding that we're completely accepted with God. And as a result, what does a person do? Well, if I'm not completely accepted, I must do some things. And he or she begins to live a, a legalistic kind of futile life and not a life of joyful service. That's an ineffective Christian. Understanding justification gives freedom to live for the Lord out of love, not fear. To be single-minded in, in the fight and not distracted or self-absorbed with false worries. The third piece of army, uh, armor e equips us to stand firm as well. It's the soldier's war boot. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The boots of Roman legionnaires were half boots made of leather with an open toe, and were tied at the ankles and then at the, uh, uh, the, sh the, uh, the shins with leather straps. The soles were heavily studded to, to keep the soldier from slipping. Battles often involved hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so firm footing was essential in order to stand firm and fight. The Christian's boot is the gospel of peace. The peace we have through the gospel. Romans chapter 5 verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Having been justified, we're at peace. We're at peace with God. There's no longer this conflict that existed. And because of that peace we have with God, we have the peace of God inner peace, that which Paul told the, the, the Philippians surpasses all comprehension and guards our hearts and minds. 
Now, that, that gives stability of mind and purpose in the heat of battle, the spiritual conflict. It was the, the greatness of the gospel that caused Paul to ask in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, if God is for us, who is against us? Well, he doesn't mean no one's against us. We have a whole array here of, of, of beings, spiritual beings that are against us and, and human beings that are against us. He certainly knew, knew that, but what he's saying is it doesn't matter because we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. And so we have the peace in the midst of battle knowing that he's defeated the enemy and we are fighting the one who has already conquered them and that no one can overcome him or us. So we stand firm and fight on. The next piece of armor is the, the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. The Roman soldier often fought with a large rectangular shield and it could cover most of the body. It, it was designed to protect from this very thing, from flaming arrows that were dipped in pitch, lit, and then shot at the opposing army, arrows that could cause a great deal of damage, as you can imagine. But these shields were able to, to form a wall of defense and, and gave the army good protection, catching the arrows and extinguishing them. Faith is the Christian warrior's shield. The act of believing in God, trusting in Him, trusting in His Word. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 5 says, the Lord says of the Lord, He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. The devil's flaming arrows are, are different things, all kinds of things, the horrible thoughts, that can account for, um, that cannot be account, counted for with uh, normal mental action. We wonder where did these things come from? Like come from like those blasphemies that that Christian hears in his head, and he he's confused. Or this is this the way I think? Where is this coming from? Oh, well, they may be doubts about God's goodness about His love for us when trials come. I think that's a very common one that the devil uses. That's a fiery dart. That stings. That hurts. That damages to think, God has failed me. That's what He'd like you to believe. The arrows may come from unexpected places. Like other Christians. Job's friends came to him and seemed very sympathetic. I think they were sympathetic. And they gave him counsel that they thought was good counsel. They weren't trying to hurt him, but it caused great damage. They didn't understand the situation. And their counsel was terrible. So these, these arrows come in, in various forms, in different ways. It, it, he hits us with thoughts that inflame passion, excite ambition generate pride or anger. We can think of something that would happen to us in the past and get angry about it all over. The only protection is faith. Looking to Christ, seeking His help, believing His Word, believing His promises. The next piece of armor is the helmet of salvation. The helmet of the Roman soldier was made of metal, either bronze or iron with, uh, with guards at the, the back of the neck and the sides of the face. It was impervious to most weapons to, to give a, a soldier vital protection. The Christian's helmet is salvation. And we receive it. That's really the word that Paul used here. It's translated, at least in the New American Standard Bible, as take. It's a little translated a little differently from the others. Take up. This is simply take. But here it's a different word from these other words that are used earlier. This really means receive. And Paul used that word for a reason. This is not for, for style, but doctrine. Salvation is a gift. It's, it's not the result of our initiative. 
We don't take it. We receive it through faith alone. Salvation is a completed work. It is salvation past, present, and future. And it keeps us safe from the enemy's wax and attacks. All of that. The believer in Jesus Christ is absolutely secure. No one can snatch us out of the Son's hand or the Father's hand. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So many places this point is made by the Lord Himself and by the apostles. We are absolutely secure in the Lord. That fact and the realization our salvation was settled at the cross gives great confidence and joy in the spiritual life and in the spiritual battle. Uh, confidence even, even in the face of death. Now to this point, all the equipment Paul has listed is defensive. The sixth piece of armor given is the only weapon of attack as well as defense. It's the sword. Roman soldiers used a short double-edged sword that was very effective in close hand-to-hand -hand combat. And that's what Paul is thinking of here. He called it the sword of the Spirit because it comes from the Spirit. He gives us the sword. And Paul defines the sword as the Word of God. So our sword is the Scriptures, which have been given to us by the Spirit of God through inspiration. All Scripture is inspired by God, Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16, meaning it is God-breathed. It comes out of the Spirit of God and into the authors of Scripture. And since He is the Spirit of truth, it is truth. It is the Word of God. The word Paul used here for for word is not the word that we're so often familiar with, logos, but here it's the word rhema, which refers to individual words or particular texts. So Paul was not referring to the general knowledge of Scripture as in the belt of truth, the, the, the sweep of, do, uh, of Scripture and the doctrines of Scripture. This is specific text of Scripture used precisely for the occasion that may be at hand and to, to cut through error or problems. It's knowing specific promises that help in time of trial or the right text in giving the gospel uh, in, in the work of evangelism. Uh, it, it takes a, a great deal of knowledge of Scripture and the wisdom to know how to use it and apply it. And that's what he's speaking of here. That's the exhortation that's behind it. Know the Scriptures and use the Scriptures wisely and well and skillfully. It's our sword. It, it is a weapon for defense and a weapon of offense. And it is the only effective way to fight error or temptation, or spread the gospel. Jesus is the great example of it. When tempted by the devil, he answered with Scripture. He didn't reason with the devil. Go back to Matthew chapter 4 and read it. And, and, and that sheds a great deal of light on passages like James chapter 4, verse 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's what Jesus did. He answered every temptation of the devil, all three of them, with Scripture. And after the third temptation, what did the devil do? He left. He left defeated. Our sword is a powerful weapon. I often come to a passage like this and think of, what was it, the 6th, 7th century, the armies of Muhammad came off the deserts of Arabia and they spread through the Middle East and North Africa and within a generation they had established themselves all over that part of the world and were even pushing in the 8th century up into France when they were stopped. What, were they, what was the method of their evangelism? The means of it? The sword, the literal sword. You convert or you die. Our sword is something completely different, but it is infinitely more effective. 
It is by preaching the Word of God that we achieve great victory for the Lord in our own lives and in the lives of others. So, again, that's what uh, Satan seeks to frustrate. That's what he seeks to uh, take away from us, the trust in the Word of God. When we preach it, things happen. When we preach it, revival occurs like the day of Pentecost or the, the Reformation or the Great Awakening. Now again, it's why Satan's schemes are to cast doubt on it and try to move us to seek other things, other means, more rational means. No, we need to stick with the Word of God. We need to know it. We need to trust it. We need to use it personally and publicly. There are six pieces of armor. He's listed them here. But as I mentioned earlier, and as we see in verse 18, there's also the need of prayer. It's not listed as a weapon, but it certainly influences every aspect of the spiritual battle. Paul commands it in verse 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. <laughs> Prayer and petition are not the same thing. Petition is specific. It, it refers to requests that we make. Prayer is more general. It, it refers to requests also but also for, for help, but also confession of sin and praise and thanksgiving. And we are to be at it. At all times, he said, meaning make, make it the regular daily pattern of your life, not just in a crisis. Be praying at all times and pray in the spirit. He directs our prayers. You wonder, how is that? Well, I think George Mueller, the great man of faith, the, the man who started the orphanages, you hear about him much from us. I have great admiration for Mueller, man of faith, he discovered that beginning the day reading and meditating on Scripture got his soul right and led to informed prayer. He wrote his primary business was to have his soul happy in the Lord. And as we study the Word of God, the Spirit brings the truth of God to our mind and communicates His will and, and enlightens us and directs us in how to pray. And so praying in the Spirit is praying under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit guides us through the Word of God. And so that's how He began the day. It's good, wise counsel for us. And we're to be praying at all times and for all the saints. And Paul was asking for prayer for himself. Verse 19 and 20, And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Speak boldly to whom? He's a prisoner in Rome. Well, to the Roman soldier that he was chained to, and was probably his model for the Christian's armor. And he did that. He spoke to the rotation of soldiers that he met. We know from Philippians chapter 1, verse 13, that, that some of the Praetorian Guard believed, and even some in Caesar's household. Prayer is effective. We all need it. Even the apostles needed the prayers of the saints and Paul was asking for that. And their prayers were answered. There's lots of news that Paul could have told them about. Some of those things that he wrote to the Philippians, one of his other prison epistles. Things about what he's doing in Rome and what had happened, what was going on in prison. He didn't have space in this letter for them for him to write these things for them. But Tychicus would take care of that, he says in verse 21. He, he who delivered this letter would then inform them of all that was happening there in Rome. 
What was important for the apostle as he concluded this, this magnificent letter that extols the sovereign grace of God is we must be people of prayer. Uh, persevering in prayer. It's God's means of blessing. Paul then concluded the letter with a prayer, a benediction. Verse 23, Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace, love, and faith is what Paul wants for the brethren. And since it's the brethren he was praying for, the peace of his request is here again, the, not the peace, not peace with God, they had that in justification, but the peace of God, personal peace that gives stability in the Christian life and joy in the Christian life. We can have that at all times. We can have joy and peace in the storms of life as Paul did in Rome, there in a prison, chained to a, a Roman guard. And ultimately, that's the gift of God's grace. And that's where the letter ends. Verse 24, Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Incorruptible is the last word of this book. It has the idea of imperishable immortal, undying love. It cannot be moved by another. That is love that's strengthened as we know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we understand our triune God, who He is and what He has done for us in grace. Now that's what Satan wishes to draw us away from through the, the spiritual war, the, the secret theater which is on playing all around us. So Paul prayed earnestly for grace, sovereign grace for the brethren. Are you one of them? You are if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. As Paul wrote earlier in this book, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. If you want the free grace of salvation, you can only receive it. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. Christ has done it all. It's only for us now to receive that work that He has achieved, that salvation that He has obtained by believing in Him. So if you've not done that, trust in Him. Join the brethren, the forgiven, the society of the redeemed, and have eternal life. May God help you to do that. Well, let's stand and sing number 35 in the Songs of Praise book. O Church Arise, number 35. Father, we look forward to that day when He comes and we do stand with Him in glory. And in the meantime, we're in this world that's fallen. We're in this spiritual war that Paul has described in Ephesians 6. May we heed his call to arms. May we be wise and put on the armor of God and, and know that we fight daily, but we do so in your power and your strength. So we thank you for that. Pray that you give us wise and <clears throat> and triumphant lives in the day-to-day -to -day affairs of life, and we live to your honor and glory. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.